Hi, welcome back to the south of France and to the ninth of our 10 spectacular walks between the Negresco Hotel in Nice and the Chapelle Saint Hospice here on Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. Today we've got a spectacular coastal walk all the way from here, the lighthouse of Saint Jean Cap Ferrat, past the Grand Hotel de Cap Ferrat, and finally ending up at the Plage des Fossettes. Along the way, we're going to discover the story of the Villa Santa Sospire, where Jean Cocteau spent 10 years of his life in a menage a trois with his patron and his adopted son. We're also going to discover the story of the Grand Hotel de Cap Ferrat and find out which We're also going to discover the story of the Grand Hotel de Cap Ferrat and find out which movie classic was born in the hotel. And we're also going to take a nosy into the villa of the great architect, Sir Norman Foster. So lace up your boots, let's get going. Now bye my friend. Look after yourself while I'm away. I shall see you in a few hours. Hopefully. It won't blow in the sea, will it? The handbrake's on. Better to be safe than sorry, as my mother always said. Let's get some water from the Bono and Sherry Blair Memorial Fountain. Cheers, Sherry. Mm. Lovely, new labour water. So you can see where we're headed today. This is where we're starting at the, the far, the lighthouse. We're going to go along here past the Grand Hotel de Cap Ferrat right the way around here, spectacular coastal path, all the way around to the Plage des Fossettes, and we get in within range of our final destination, the Point de Saint Hospice. And it really is an absolutely ravishing winter's day here on the Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. The sky is blue, the sun is out, and it's sharp. It's very sharp. Bonjour, bonjour. Bonjour, bonjour. Here you can see one of our friends, the uh, World War II lookout points. Of course, the lighthouse here at Saint Jean Cap Ferrat was uh, almost totally destroyed in the war. And you can see, just like the ones uh, we looked at in the uh, our Cap de Nice walk, you can see where the, either the cannon or, in the case of the Cap de Nice, I think they had a giant light, um, light source that was sort of pushed back into the, into the rock face there. come round here you get your first uh, sight of the Club Dauphin in the distance which is the uh, fantastic saltwater swimming pool of the Grand Hotel de Cap Ferrat. So you can see just behind me here some of the cabanas from the, uh, the Club Dauphin, which is the uh, fantastic sort of health club stroke, fresh uh, uh, saltwater swimming pool that is connected to the Grand Hotel de Cap Ferrat. Now, the Grand Hotel de Cap Ferrat is, I think, still regarded as one of the great hotels of the world. 
It was actually built in 1908. It's got about 70 rooms. Uh, I think uh, 24 or more of them are suites. The current going rate is, um, well, I looked this morning, the cheapest room I could find was 500 pounds. And uh, the suites, well, they were 5,000 pounds per night. But of all the stories that are associated with this incredible hotel, two really stand out in my mind. One concerns the swimming instructor, a man I think called Pierre Grunneberg. Now, he is now 90 years old. He's still alive, he's still, he doesn't work here anymore. But in his day, he has taught everyone from Picasso to John F. Kennedy to swim. Now, the other story that's always fascinating me uh, concerning the Grand Hotel de Cap is the story of a man called Murray Burnett. Now, Murray Burnett is probably someone you've never heard of. And yet, I will almost guarantee that the film that he played a fundamental part in creating, you will have heard of. Because Murray Burnett comes here and he is in the bar one night and he sees a black pianist and it gives him the idea for a play. It's a stage play and he calls it Everybody Comes to Rick's. Now unfortunately the stage play couldn't find a producer on Broadway and Murray Burnett sells the rights to the play to Warner Brothers for $20,000. They then employ three other screenwriters. They don't employ Mr. Burnett. Uh, they go on and adapt it. They take the central character of Rick. They take some of Mr. Burnett's lines. They take quite a lot of the story, he says. They say it was an un unfilmable story, etc. And they turn it into the Humphrey Bogart vehicle, Casablanca, which of course goes on to become one of the most successful movies in the history of cinema it wins an Oscar. Now, poor old Murray Burnett is meantime getting no recognition for this. He has signed away the rights to his play. He gets increasingly angry. He tries to sue Warner Brothers and the screenwriters for six and a half million after they say that, well, his play was unusable and they couldn't do anything with it. Uh, unfortunately, he fails. Uh, and he is essentially written out of history. But then, towards the end of his life, Warner Brothers relent and they give him back the rights to his stage play, Everybody Comes to Rick's, and I think they give him about $100,000. And I think in 1991, the play is finally staged in London. I think I can just about remember it, but sadly, it only runs a month. That's what you'd call bad luck or bad decisions, you decide. See if we can um, negotiate our way around this truck. So what I always say to you, the, uh, the building work on Cap Fry just never stops because well, I guess the thing about being very rich is you can just keep changing everything. And uh, believe me, they do. And as you come round this corner, you get your first glimpse of what everyone round here knows as the Norman Foster Villa. Now this is not just a house built by a great architect, this is a house built by a great architect for his own family. Uh, and Foster had an incredible job to construct this place because if you build a new villa here, you have to simply build it within the imprint of the old one that you have knocked down. Uh, and this can pose incredible logistical problems and uh, I think in the past as some um, has led to, well, certain amounts of, you know, 
backhand has been paid to local officials to try and contravene planning regulations, etc. But obviously I don't want to get into that. But Foster had no luck and he had to construct this, what I think is an absolute masterpiece within the planning regulations. It's got these incredible sort of sails uh, that are there to try and keep the sun away in the summer, but then to move and to allow the sunlight to come in in winter when you actually want the heat on a day like today. Sadly, Foster doesn't live there anymore. The reason is his family expanded and he tried to buy the villa next door and then expand into it, but the council weren't having it. Um, it's fair to say I think there was quite a lot of resistance to the whole villa and to the look of it. Uh, I think it's an absolute masterpiece. You can see uh, another bit of the boot, as it were, of uh, Saint Jean Cap Ferrat, and it's there that we will eventually ultimately be headed on our final, our tenth walk, when doubtless we shall be greeted at the Chapelle Saint Hospice by cheering crowds, celebrating the, the fact that I've managed to do this walk, an achievement that probably hasn't been paralleled since, I, I don't know, Hillary, Edmund Hillary, Everest. Didn't he go up Everest? Or was that Ted Mould? Oh no, that was a double glazing. Anyway, that's in episode 10. And this um, unfinished, abandoned, modernist villa always fascinates me um, there are a number of these on saint jean cap ferrat you kind of imagine that it was built without permissions and then somebody clamped down and stopped them halfway through um, but of course it's now been graffitied up and uh, it's just such a strange thing to find on a place where you know <laughs> The real estate or the, the price per square meter or square foot of this land is probably amongst the most expensive of anywhere on earth. And yet there you have this incredible villa with a view out over the Mediterranean and it was never finished and it's completely abandoned. Shall we have a look in? We probably shouldn't because they've, uh, they've put wires on the doors and there might be all kinds of sin going on in here. There might be the Saint Jean Cap for our opium den, or uh, it might be a, a brothel. I was once taken uh, across the desert in Aswan in Egypt by some men on uh, camels, and we were in the middle of nowhere. There was literally nothing except a dead camel, which we passed. And then this guy said, you want to visit Nubian brothel? And quite literally, there was a sort of left turn in the desert and, uh, and this tent, and there was a Nubian brothel. I mean, I obviously only went for research purposes. And they do seem to have uh, completely fenced it up now. What a shame, because you used to be able to go in it. Look, there's Victoria Wood on the wall. What a view out to sea it would have had. Someone must have dreamt of living there. I wonder if he'll catch anything. And this set uh, patch of sort of wasteland has always intrigued me because again you think why would it just be left because it's not a park it's not really um, I mean people do use it for um, dogging I mean walking their dogs not not dogging um, 
but um, uh, you know why would it be left but then recently I came across this um, old photograph and I think this amazingly was in possibly the 50s 60s maybe even into the 70s a campsite can you imagine <laughs> <laughs> a campsite on Cap Farrar. I think it'd be fabulous. I think they should bring it back. Democratise the cap. I don't think I'm going to win that one. And flew! <laughs> <laughs> and some quite good graffiti art around here. It's a shame somebody's ruined that by giving her a beard. They did that to Mona Lisa, didn't they? Terrible. Now, uh, seeing that bit of street art um, has reminded me of the other great villa, uh, or the other villa with a great, great backstory that exists along this stretch. It's a villa called Villa Santa Sospia. Now, Villa Santa Sospia is actually located near where we began this walk. It's sort of just over the road from the Somerset Morn Villa. Now, by Saint Jean Cap for our standards, it's not an enormous house. I mean. I think it did eventually sell quite recently for about 14 million, but it is nothing like the sort of 70, 80, 100 million pound villas. But the backstory to this place is absolutely incredible because this is what is known as the Cocteau Villa. This is the villa where the great artist and filmmaker and poet, so associated with Villefranche and the Welcome Hotel, uh, etc., down here in the south of France, this is the villa where he lived basically for uh, quite a lot of the decade between 1950 and his death in 1963. Uh, he didn't actually own it. Lots of people think he owned it. He didn't. It was actually owned by his patron, uh, a woman called Francine uh, Weisweiler. Now, Francine Weisweiler was a well-to-do Jewish lady whose parents fled the south of France and fled Cannes, understandably, when the Nazis came in. Of course, for much of the war, the Italians were in charge down here and they were um, tolerant of the Jews and Jews were able to sort of change their name and evade arrest. But when the Nazis came in, all that changed. And in fact, uh, I think at least one member of the Weisweiler family uh, was sent off to the gas chambers. But the father of Francine said to her, if we survive the Holocaust, I will buy us a house. And that house is Santa Sospia. Now in 1950, when Francine comes to it, she has, I think, quite recently divorced from her husband and she meets Cocteau and Cocteau's adopted son, uh, who I think was called Dudu, or oh, that was his nickname. He appeared in sort of two or three of Cocteau's films. I think originally it was um, Cocteau's gardener, uh, and, uh, but eventually uh, Cocteau decided he would um, <coughs> adopt him. Um, anyway, they move into the house and they set up what is essentially a menage a trois. Now, when I say that, I'm not, uh, I don't mean necessarily that uh, Cocteau was having uh, sex with Francine. I don't, I don't uh, have any evidence of that. Uh, I think it's probably unlikely, though Dudu, well, who knows? He was definitely bisexual. Um, but they move into this house and they have an incredible decade together. Francine pays for everything. Cocteau decorates the walls with what he described as his tattoos. Uh, I think in the bedroom there's a picture of Bacchus after a bender. Uh, upstairs there's a picture of Narcissus. Narcissus, that's a warning apparently to Dudu of the dangers of too much self-regard. Very wise. Um, but it is an incredible villa and an incredible era uh, when Cocteau is inducted into the, I was going to say the Hall of Fame, <laughs> French Hall of Fame. But uh, I think, what's it called? The French Order of Letters, French Letters, something like that. But anyway, when he is, um, she has this incredible uh, outfit commissioned for him. 
Uh, Yves Saint Laurent visits the villa, they're great friends. She's a muse of Yves Saint Laurent. Um, it's that kind of decadent life. But towards the end of the 1960s, everything changes because Francine uh, meets a new man and he apparently cannot stand Cocteau. And there's a big falling out and Cocteau goes back to live in Villefranche and uh, he will be dead within two years. And on his deathbed, I think there is a sort of, uh, uh, the two of them are reunited. But the story doesn't end there because in the subsequent years, Francine's daughter, Carol, takes on the ownership of the house. And uh, they appoint, uh, as a sort of caretaker, a man called Eric, who um, I know slightly. Uh, and Eric had been the sort of nursemaid to Francine. Uh, and he tells incredible stories about how towards the end of her life, when he first met her, uh, to come and, and sort of try and get the job, how she was smoking from an opium pipe. So this was really sort of hope bohemianism, high bohemianism. Um, uh, anyway, Eric, uh, becomes the sort of caretaker of Santa Sospia and allows people to look round. And I've been, I think, uh, three times now. Uh, and you, you used to be able to make an appointment with Eric and you'd meet him at a certain time at the gate and it was all very cloak and dagger. And you would go in and have an incredible tour of this house. And I say incredible because a lot of it was peeling and the, 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 the pictures and the walls were peeling off. And you know, there'd be some bread on the table and you couldn't quite work out whether it was meant to be Cocteau's bread or whether uh, Eric had just had his breakfast, etc., etc. So it was this completely fantastic almost sort of living museum to Cocteau. Anyway, eventually, I'm afraid, this became too expensive for Carol to keep on the taxes. And uh, she was uh, forced to sell the house. Uh, and in the last couple of years, the only people who've been able to look round it uh, are actually the guests of the Grand Hotel de Cap Ferrar, who I think for a fee of about £5,000 can actually have the Cocteau dining experience uh, and go in there and uh, sit on the terrace and have a cocktail and, uh, uh, and uh, eat their dinner amongst, uh, amongst um, Cocteau's pictures. But there may be good news because the villa has been restored. It is an official monument in France, so it can't be ruined. And the new owner, who is a guy I think who lives in Monaco, has every intention of trying to continue this tradition of opening it up to the public. Now, let's just hope that by public, we don't just mean uh, guests of the Grand Hotel de Cap, much as we love them and the, much as we love the hotel. It'd be quite nice uh, it, for us to go back. But if you ever get a chance to go to the Villa Santa Sospia, I think it is one of the absolute highlights of the French Riviera. And an interesting coda to the Villa Santa Sospia story concerns Cocteau and Cocteau's adopted son. Because I didn't know very much about him and uh, I was kind of thinking, well, surely they were lovers, not really father and son. Uh, and of course they were lovers. Uh, and I thought, well, why did Cocteau want to adopt him? That's a bit um, <clears throat> weird. But of course, in truth, the reason he wanted to adopt him was it was the only way that he could leave legally his estate and control of his estate uh, after his death to Dudu. Uh, and that is why he made him his adopted son. So once you get to this bit, you have to leave the coastal bit and uh, come inland because you have to sort of go around the, the garden of this, uh, this huge villa here, which um, many years ago, I'd appear over the wall and um, it has a golf course. <laughs> not a crazy golf course, actually it's not got a course, it's got a golf hole, but it actually had a proper par three hole with bunkers and, uh, and greens. Nice life if you can get it.
let's carry on down this road now towards the Plage de Fossette, which is a wonderful little secret beach with a fantastic cafe above it. Um, and uh, just to give you a quick reminder to hit the subscribe button because uh, we're getting ready for our big um, French Riviera challenge, which I sort of announced last week once we've done our trials of the car, you know, our, um, our um, test flights as it were. Um, we're going to set off and we're going to drive the whole of the French Riviera, not in one episode, uh, hopefully the whole of the French Riviera from Monton to Marseille. Um, so if you've got any ideas of places we should visit, unusual places, out of the way places, quirky places, then please drop us a comment uh, in the comment section below this video. And if you um, if you're, uh, live on the French Riviera, and you'd be willing to let us charge our car up, it would be hugely appreciated because, uh, well, we can't, um, we can't rely on the charging stations that much, we're finding out this week. And so as you get to this corner, you're back on the sea and uh, you get a lovely view of this fabulous beach, the Plage des Fossettes. Gorgeous. Funny, being down here has triggered a real memory. Many years ago, uh, I uh, and a, a friend of ours, we bought this little boat. And I mean little, it was, it was a sort of bathtub with an outboard motor uh, that we got, I think, for 500 euros. Um, and being me, I didn't do any research into what you needed to do to sail one of these boats. But um, uh, I hit on the idea of um, saving money on a petrol can because I noticed that nearby there was a pool uh, being redone at a villa. And so I, I saw these sort of what looked like jerry cans and I thought, oh, these will be fantastic to put the petrol. I won't have to buy a petrol can from Carrefour. So anyway, um, I um, washed this out thoroughly and put petrol in it. Anyway, on this given day, a um, Richard, Mr. Boo, had some friends had flown in from England, they'd never been to the south of France before, and I thought, well, I'll show off a bit, I'll take them out in my boat. Uh, and so we took them out in the boat, and we sailed around from Villefranche, and we came into here, and we had a picnic, and it was all marvellous. And then I said, right, we'll sail back, and we'll go in front of the Grand Hotel du Cap. Uh, and on the way, I decided to add some more fuel. Uh, unfortunately, what I didn't realise is that these... Um, plastic containers had actually had in them glue to stick the tiles down on the base of the swimming pool. Well, the fuel must have loosened the glue. The glue then clogged up the engine. The engine failed just off the Grand Hotel de Cap and by this point the waves are getting quite high. I, uh, you know, being the captain, uh, decided that we should man the oars. So we pull out these emergency oars well, we take one pull of the emergency oars and uh, quite literally both of them snap. They are so rotten. So we're now off the rocks of the Grand Hotel de Cap in what is an increasing storm and um, we've got absolutely no way of controlling the boat. 
I'm absolutely terrified that we're going to literally hit the rocks. Um, so I um, order abandoned ships. So Mr. Boo and his two friends in all their clothes swim ashore to the Grand Hotel de Cap. Uh, meantime, I stay on the boat. Then I eventually abandon the boat because I get too scared. They send out the life, <laughs> the lifeboat. This is absolutely true. Uh, and uh, and the, eventually the boat is towed back to Nice. I mean, it's so little, this boat, I can't tell you. But by which point Richard's friends have lost uh, their possessions, both their passports. I've never met these people before. You can imagine just how um, impressed with me they were. Uh, and I have to then go to Nice Port to try and reclaim the boat and pay a fine for them having towed it round. Uh, well, unfortunately, the boat was in such a state that we were never able to sail again. Uh, I did, however, reclaim a bottle of wine that was on it. Uh, but from that point onwards, that boat was known as Gay Abandon. So that brings us to the end of this week's walk. There's just one more to do to the Chapelle Santos piece. If you've enjoyed this, please give us a like. It makes a big difference to the algorithm. Don't forget to subscribe. Our French Riviera challenge in our Citroen Ami is coming up very soon. I'll see you on the next one. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye.